The last time we left, we were seeing Caravaggio complete his project for the Contarelli Chapel in San Luigi dei Francesi. The next commission that he gets is right on the back of that, the tail end of it, and it's for this ch a chapel in this church, an Augustinian church called Santa Maria del Popolo, which is in the Piazza del Popolo on the north side of the city of Rome. The project is given to him by Monsignor Tiberio Cerasi, who is the treasurer general to Pope Clement VIII. It was purchased by Cerasi in July of 1600. Chirazi was not a major figure in the art world of 16th and 17th century Rome, and he was probably inspired for this commission by recommendations from Cardinal del Monte, who was knowledgeable of Caravaggio's work, and by Cardinal Aldo Brandini, who was knowledgeable of Nibale Caracci's work. Shortly after his July purchase of the chapel, Chirazi commissioned the Bolognese painter Anibale Caracci to provide the altarpiece that you can see here. This is an altarpiece that shows the Assumption of the Virgin. In September, he contracted Caravaggio to produce the two lateral canvases, the one that you can see here, and then the other one, which is not visible in this photograph, but it's over here. Those show the conversion of St. Peter on this side and the martyrdom of St. Peter over here. The subjects honored the Virgin, as you can see in the altarpiece, and the patron saint of the papacy and the founding of the Roman church, St. Peter. Chirazi died on May 5th of 1601 and was buried in the chapel vault. Caravaggio's paintings were installed in November of 1601, so he never saw the paintings before his death. The altarpieces Caravaggio did seem to be in direct conversation and even competition with the major artists of his time. This competition was at the forefront of the Chirazi Chapel. Anibale Caracci's altarpiece of the Assumption of the Virgin was commissioned earlier than Caravaggio's piece, so it's likely that he's thinking about and knowledgeable of Caravaggio, uh, of Caracci's work when he's working. Caracci was amused and sometimes dismayed by the outright naturalism in Caravaggio's work. His altarpiece here is bright and very physical. It's uh, kind of a hyper-classical version of Caracci's normal painterly style and warm style, which he used in the Farnese gallery, which we've looked at. The competition that we see visually enacted by these two fell into a category of early modern Italian art debate or art competition, which was called paragone, paragone. You can see the word highlighted right here, which just means to compare or to contrast two things together. So we have two different artists operating in two very different styles and the paragone we can see actively happening between them because of these compositional differences. In Anibale Caracci's altarpiece, there are bright colors used. Again, those bodies are really large. We've got 11 of the 12 apostles that are shoved into the, to the viewer's space. We can see the Virgin's tomb here and she's rising up above it. But the, the figures are very weighty and pressed very close to the picture plane. Caravaggio's paintings adhere to his dark, tenebristic style. They show, again, just like at the Contarelli Chapel, the beginning and end to the Apostle Peter's story. They show, uh, excuse me, for, to the Apostle Peter and Paul's story. They show the beginning of the Apostle's Paul's story with his conversion scene on the right, and they show the end of the Apostle Peter's story with his martyrdom on the left. Let's look first at the conversion scene. In the Tarazi Chapel, Caravaggio's paintings do not conform to a pre-existing actual light source as they did in San Luigi dei Francesi. Nevertheless, we have striking tenebrism and chiaroscuro represented. This painting shows the moment of the quiet conversion of St. Paul and was appropriate for the chapel in the Counter-Reformation where emotional scenes of a saint's conversion were commonplace. Furthermore, the topic had been explored by Michelangelo Buonarroti in the Vatican Pauline chapels, which you can see here, the conversion of 
the saint down below with this strike a uh, stroke of blinding light we have christ up here and the, the horse from which paul has fallen and we also have scenes like this um, as central to the foundation of the catholic church since paul was one of the founding apostles and its pendant showing peter was the first pope so the scenes here are very fitting for a man who's involved with the the very nexus of catholicism <clears throat> In our scene, we see Paul having fallen off of his horse as a stroke, stroke of light comes in from the very right side of the painting, right in topper, top, upper right-hand corner of the painting. We can see that light source here. The groom, well, the, the scene seems to take place in a, in a barn or in the stables, and a groom is holding onto car, uh, the horse that Caravaggio has painted, Paul's horse here, so it doesn't step on the saint of calming the horse. Saul, our Christian persecuting, uh, our Christian persecuting Roman general, is blinded by this light, and indeed we see his eyes closed there. <clears throat> and we, uh, this is a quiet moment of conversion. The uh, energy is transmitted through his pose and through the contrasts of light rather than in a as in the one by michelangelo a kind of crowd of figures that are gathering and reacting to the event the foreshortening of his body the darkness of the palette and the spartan inclusion of figures makes for a visually engaging and involving altarpiece <clears throat> This was a second attempt at the painting. In fact, the first one, which was a crowded composition featuring five figures and the horse, is dense and rather mannerist in its composition. We see more landscape detail in it. This actually looks like Saul is on the road to Damascus as the story goes, rather than in a stable in the final version. Nevertheless, this is the one that we ended up with. It's more, it's simplified and more focused on a kind of internal turmoil rather than an external turmoil. And there are, again, several other figures here. We get an angel holding Christ and we have this companion um, as a stand-in for the groom. We don't know exactly what happened with this recreation of the painting or um by caravaggio perhaps it was rejected by the augustinian friars who oversaw the church perhaps because in the acts that record this event christ does not appear to saul but does so as light but as we saw in michelangelo buonarroti's version we actually get a representation of christ so it wasn't uncommon to see it depicted this way so that doesn't seem like a very valid explanation it may have been Caravaggio himself who wanted to replace the panel because he noticed that it wasn't as maybe poignant and effective as it could have been since it's so crowded with figures. And if we take into consideration that he knew about Caracci's panel, which had a lot of figures in it, he might have taken a more simplified approach to his composition to the arrangement of figures in his composition so that he could create a more striking contrast with Karachi. And I have a couple, just a detail here. On the opposite side of the chapel, you can see the crucifixion of St. Peter. This painting is done as typical of scenes of St. Peter's execution. He was murdered by crucifixion, but he demanded that it be done upside down so as not to create a too close of a comparison with the martyrdom of Christ. We can see in this in this version um, by Caravaggio, we also have four figures represented. We have the striking lighting that is characteristic of Caravaggio, spotlighting the elderly saints 
vulnerable forms who's already been nailed to the cross and is in the final stages of the martyrdom, which requires the cross to be set up. And so this man is crouching to lift it up on his back. And if we look at this better view um, from an art historical standpoint, at least to see all of the details, you can see that his feet are dirty. We've got a rock in the foreground here, his hair cold, holding a shovel in his hands, having just dug the hole to put the top and the, the bottom of the cross in. So um, a really compelling but Spartan use of figures and background details. And this too had been done by Michelangelo in the same Pauline chapels that the conversion of St. Paul was in. So Caravaggio is certainly in conversation with his namesake and creating new ways of conveying old topics at this point in time. Unexpected and unorthodox is the representation of Cupid that you see here in Caravaggio's Victorious Cupid or Amor Vint Omnia, an oil on canvas painting that was produced for Cardinal Giustiniani, who probably kept it covered in his house so as to reveal and shock viewers. We still feel shocked by its blatant nudity today. There are lots of features in this composition, the wing, the arrows, the lute, and viol viola that, and the central location that draw the eye shamelessly toward the genitals of this Cupid. It is in fact a rebellion against the classical naturalism of his contemporaries where cupids are cute and charmingly mischievous. This is a, a different kind of mis mischievousness presented to us here. This victorious cupid makes us think of Bacchus. It's about seduction and temptation. We see things that are part of the kind of everyday world, a suit of armor, a crown, the instruments. But these things are being abandoned in the foreground. And Cupid, as a representative of love, seems to say that love is more important than those things. This also uh, rebels against and contrasts with representations that had been done by Michelangelo of figures in similar poses. So he is reprising the Michelangelo motif and then re-exerting it in new ways. Take, for example, Michelangelo's uh, uh, victory sculpture that you see here, which has a similar position, or his St. Bartholomew from The Last Supper, or even one of his Ignudi from the Sistine Chapel. So Caravaggio is building upon this language of the Michelangelesque, but reinterpreting it in new ways, rebelling against parts of it and reconceiving it for patrons. This canvas also has something to do with Paragone and competition because it was the subject of rivalry between Giovanni Baglione, a competing painter in Caravaggio's life, who painted a very similar painting the same year for the same patron, except in his version, it shows sacred love. We have a kind of archangel-like representation looming over our Cupid here. Caravaggio's Cupid. In another unexpected twist of the usual iconography for a subject, Caravaggio's Death of the Virgin was a controversial picture when it was first un unveiled. The Death of the Virgin was an un unusual topic after the 15th century. But the way that it was typically shown can be seen in the Montaigne painting on the left. The Virgin is appearing as though she's asleep on a bed, and the apostles 
crowd around her, mourning in their various ways her passing. She seems like she's sleeping. Um, she's she's dressed in her typical red, excuse me, blue, deep blue mantle, and she's she's laying on a red um, linen bed. In Caravaggio's version, which was a uh, the altarpiece for a chapel that belonged to a papal lawyer, Lorenzo, Lorenzo Cherubini, again, someone like Terrazzi, who was not a major art patron of the time, the Virgin is shown not composed in a sleep, but rather having very much uh, recently expired. Her hand juts out, foreshortened to the left, and her head lists lifelessly onto her left shoulder. She sits on a table rather than, she lays on a table rather than a bed, and her feet hang off of that table, and her dress has been indecorously pulled up around her ankles, exposing her feet to the viewer. In the foreground, we have the presence of Mary Magdalene, weeping, which is in, unusual, rather unorthodox, for scenes of the death of the Virgin. Note that present here in Montaigne's version. But may have been a way for Caravaggio to reference the people who would have been serviced by this altarpiece, which were the car discalced Carmelites who ministered to fallen women, and so representing a former prostitute mourning the death of the Virgin was a way of including those women and identifying them with the many identifying with the many viewers of the altarpiece. The apostles that crowd around her is customary. Only 11 are represented. Judas is left out here. Light catches the bald heads of a couple of them in the foreground. But the canvas, um, for all its excellence in composition and shock, was actually rejected by the patrons. And Peter Paul Rubens, who was in Rome at the time, persuaded his patron, the Duke of Mantua, Vincenzo Gonzaga, to purchase the painting. It was rejected because of a couple of the pieces that I piece of information that I've mentioned. She's not the Virgin is not in a not in a bed, but on a table. This was indecorous. She's not dressed in blue as she usually is, but has this jarring blood red color around her her main dress. Her hair is uncombed, her arms are unfolded, her feet are immodestly exposed as her dress is pulled up. She appears overall as though she did not die in a state of grace, but was just an ordinary woman, and this was not fit for the chapel, or was deemed unfit for the chapel for which it was supposed to be installed. So if you want to see it today, you go to the Louvre, <clears throat> where it eventually ended up. Commission for the Vitrici Chapel in the Chiesa Nuova, an oratorian church in Rome, this painting, rather unlike the previous one, won much acclaim. This was seen as a dignified and powerful image of the entombment of Christ. Giovanni Baglione and Gian Pietro Bellori, biographers who were quick to deride Caravaggio, actually praised this one. Christ's body is being actively lowered into a tomb. <coughs> the edge of which juts out into our space. You can see it here. It is a quiet painting where Nicodemus and John the Evangelist are the figures, Nicodemus and John the Evangelist are the figures who are actively lowering the body into the grave as the three Marys above them react in different ways, some more despondent than others, to his death. It was commissioned for a chapel that had a dedication to the Pietà, the Pietà being the Virgin Mary mourning the Christ, the body of the lifeless body of Christ. So there's reference here to Michelangelo's Pietà, but and Pietà in general through the way that the arm hangs down here. But we don't see, for example, um, a typical Pietà represented for us. It's rather a step sort of beyond the Pietà, the Virgin Mary here standing. It becomes, uh, if we think about it in that setting, more of a meditation and less an icon-driven representation of the scene. It's not this iconic Mary holding Christ on her chest, but rather this active 
entombment of Christ. Soon after that painting was completed, Caravaggio was on the move. He killed a man in Rome in 1606, and with a death sentence attached to his head, he had to flee the city. He went to Naples first, where he painted this for the church of the Pio Monte della Misericordia. In 1607, he was in Malta, where he painted one of his largest canvases. This was well received by his patrons. In fact, Caravaggio was made a Knight of St. John in July of 1608, shortly after it was made. The composition makes a greater use of empty space, shrinking his figures from those canvases that we've seen prior. A wall with a large arched doorway provides our backdrop. You can see the doorway here. And two figures lean out through a barred window to see what's taking place in the street outside of them. They provide witnesses to the horrific event taking place, and they mirror the kind of rubbernecking that we as spectators do as well. In the scene in the foreground, Salome holds a gold bull ready to receive the head of John the Baptist. Herodias stands here. And the executioner, having already used the knife that we see laying on the ground here to start the, the act of beheading, takes his knife from his belt and gets ready to finish the job. Blood is already spilling forth, and he's actually used it, Caravaggio, to spell out his name, signing the commission or signing the canvas. Public executions were a very common scene in the 17th century, so the horror and spectacle of such an event is probably less removed from life when it was made than it is to us today. Caravaggio was imprisoned soon after making this altarpiece, this altarpiece for attacking another knight. He managed to escape the prison on Malta and fled to the island of Sicily, where he landed at Syracuse. He painted a burial of St. Lucy there, went to Messina, the port city, did a few paintings there as well, and then eventually started to make his way back to Rome because he had heard that he was going to receive a papal pardon. He was mysteriously arrested at Porto Ercole um, on the Tuscan coast. Released two days later, he missed his boat, which had his belongings on it, tried to catch it running down the river, and got sick running in the hot summer sun, from which he never recovered and died in July 1610. 